Thanks so much to our title sponsor, Visit Bloomington. We would not be here without them. Check them out, visitbloomington.com. Hey, say, honey, let's go out to eat. Relieve our culinary duties. With all these restaurants to sweep us off our feet. They're bound to turn us into foodies. No dishes, no dishes, no dishes. We'll have a bottle of wine, relax and have a good time. No dishes, no dishes. <laughs> so, so here is the, here is the, uh, here is the. I hate to actually bring this up because then people get weird, and I say. The challenge is ask me a question I haven't heard before. Oh, I could do it. Trust and you me. know what? It's, I've already it's been... like, and then that, then they say well, boxers or briefs or some lame ass shit like right, that. Right. Yeah. So I, I don't, I don't throw that out anymore. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. yeah so <laughs> I, I had that on my list here. Yeah. So I'm glad I, you gave me a heads up so I didn't ask that. No, I was thinking that. I was like, dude, I guarantee you, I'm going to ask you so many things that you're like, yep, heard this before. But well, I'll just push the tape recorder, you know. <laughs> yeah. 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 So uh, are we recording? We are rolling. Okay. So I, uh, this is jumping into mid-career, and uh, um, I had the extraordinary experience of writing a movie about Mickey Mantle, all right? And uh, he was my hero growing up, and I ended up spending a weekend with him in New York, and a lot of people came up to him and asked him, you know, questions about Billy and Whitey and this thing and that home, or, you know, the usual things. And I could actually see his his eyes glaze over <laughs> when he answered the question. It was like someone else was talking yeah. that he just, he was like a jukebox and he, he hit D one yeah. and that was the Billy and Whitey story. <laughs> yeah. It's like and a politician. He was yeah, just yeah, like, oh, same thing. Yeah, yeah. I got my canned answer. I've been doing yes. it on the campaign trail. Yeah, that's trail. right. You know, it's like a guy singing his greatest hits and, uh, he he probably doesn't even he's thinking about a hundred other oh, yeah. things he's, while he's he singing. He blacks out guy. while he's yeah, talking. Yeah, he's he's thinking about his grocery list, yeah. you know, while he's thinking. <laughs> yeah, he's so, like mozzarella. Yeah. I need to get some lettuce. Right. <laughs> so when I did finally get Mickey alone, my biggest challenge was I got to engage him in a way that he will actually answer questions. If they're um, not that he's heard before, but I put them a different kind of way that will make him think and make him kind of collect words and and share something with me that he doesn't normally share. Yeah. That was my biggest challenge. It was hard because that guy could drink. Oh, and, yeah. the, and the more- <laughs> Was he pounding them when you oh, were Oh, he was <laughs> pounding them big time. He was, it, and, I, and I made the mistake of trying to make him feel comfortable by, by, uh, by drinking along with him. So <laughs> at, at, at the end of the sixth Stoli on the rocks with a twist, oh my God. I was like, I forgot why I was even there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're just <laughs> I mean, like, it's like, hey, let's, uh, where are the women, Mickey? Uh, yeah. you know. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like vodka on the rocks will do that to you. Yeah. Ah, uh, well, yeah, those were the days that are no longer. Yeah. All right. <laughs> you and me both, my friend. Yes. <laughs> I've since moved on. Mm. Uh, we, on that note, we do have non alcoholic sponsors now. It's uh, they make non-alcoholic rum, non-alcoholic gin, no buzz bottles. Yeah. Oh, really? It's it's That's, very interesting. I did not bring it out last episode. And I was supposed to. Okay. I'm sorry, Maddie. Yeah. <laughs> that, yeah that's great. Uh, so we're gonna we'll make some uh, zero cocktails. Do you ever go go over to farm at all? I do quite yeah, a so bit. Yeah. Doug Daniel's a friend of mine. Oh, nice. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. So Doug, who does yeah. the whole bar program, yeah, I know. There, yeah. good friend of mine. He yeah. was actually the first episode we ever recorded of this. Okay. We got drunk in my apartment <laughs> at this table. Um, said a lot of things that we can't say now, you know. Um, but he's he's had some really. I've gone in there and he makes me some mocktails uh -huh. and like you could not tell at all. Yeah. There's no. Great. There's none of that little bit of burn. But if a cocktail's yeah. done right, that's not really there anyway. Right. Um, but it is crazy how things yeah. have just uh, changed mm -hmm. and. Uh, yep. Gotten to the point where if you stop drinking, you don't really feel like you're missing out. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Other than um, just the therapy your muscles go through of loosening up a little bit and getting yeah. that fresh reset. I, I, um, I've always been a big wine guy. Um, I mean, I, I dove into it with a passion uh, when I lived in California and put together quite a cellar that's actually still there. I still have, a, you know, a, a lot of wine there, yeah. but, but I, I've never given it up, uh, but I don't drink as much uh, wine. I go to tastings uh, here and there, but, um, 
you know, uh, after about, once I get into the third glass, you know, I, I don't, I kind of begin to re, uh, I, I don't lose the day to be functioning at the kind of level I want to function. And right. I just don't think it's worth it at this point. Yeah, absolutely. That's how I was. I don't know how much we want to dive into on this, but that's how I was with weed when I was younger. Yeah. Where like I loved it for a while. Yeah. Like smoked all day when I was 19, 20. Yeah. But then at a certain point, I'm just like, man, I'm not functioning how I want to function. Correct. When I'm so I yeah. just like, I don't, I want to be sharp. I yeah. want to be there. Right. You know, and when I was younger, I could be. Right. You know, even when, and then after a while, I'm like, this isn't fun anymore. I just feel like I'm just dumbing myself down. So part of why, how does that, how does that affect me? And, and, uh, you know, when I have, even if it's a slight hangover, you know, with three glasses instead of two glasses, and I normally have one, but, uh, uh, a lot of my day-to-day work and the projects I'm involved with involve decision-making, constant decision-making. And you cannot be a great decision-maker unless you're really sharp and really clear and also communicate because I'm working with other people. I function as a consultant uh, with a lot of other writers because I'm not doing sports movies and I'm not doing original scripts anymore for other for hire. So, uh, but I'm doing this other side, turned out to be a little side gig that kind of blown out of proportion now. And, um, it, it's, uh, it's really fun because I don't have to write. <laughs> like, <laughs> all I have to do is give notes. Oh, that's great. <laughs> that's yeah. it. You know, it's like people say, well, don't you miss writing? I say, you know, the worst part of my job is not making the movies, although it's hard, you know, it's stressful mentally, physically, et cetera. The worst part of my job is writing. Because I truly hate writing, huh. you know, and, and, uh, you know, Dorothy Parker said it best, uh, uh, asking her about how, what she thinks about, you know, the process she said, simple, I hate writing, but I love having written. And so I know I need to go get to the end in order to make the movies I want to make, because I think about the movies I want to make in my mind. So I have a camera in my mind and I'm shooting them and I'm watching it. Then I have to transcribe and communicate exactly what I see and hear onto the page. That is what I'm doing when I'm writing. So when people say, oh, you're a writer, or this is this is a writer of this and that, and, and refer to me as a writer, it never feels right to me because I always think of myself as a filmmaker, you know, first. Yeah. And writing is just part of the, the process. The pro- interesting. Wow. Yeah. That's so fascinating. So it's like, yeah, you want to have the vision and you want to execute it and see it all put together and done right. But it just that, that process of getting there sucks. Yeah. No, well, the, process, <laughs> the process of getting it on the page yeah. truly sucks. Yeah. <laughs> but once it's on the page and, and people uh, decide, you know, and I'm able to get people to like it, then it becomes much more collaborative. Yeah. And then then there's a different energy and a different kind of way of communicating your vision and what you want and knowing what to fight for and what to give in. And, you know, it's it's a constant dance. So are you able to speak on what it is now that's kind of getting blown out that you're giving notes on? Uh, yeah, I, to some extent. I mean, I'll, I'll tell you I'll tell you one project that that I think is intriguing uh, that just about ready to get going. And that is, and I was offered originally to write this and that is the Johnny Wooden story. And a, I'm not going to do another basketball movie. B, um, I, I'm, I wasn't interested in, you know, UCLA. And, uh, and I, I end up talking to the producers and I said, look, I will be involved, uh, you know, as a consultant because I, I, if you would do it this way, I don't think it necessarily needs to be called this, but I want it to be thought of this way. Johnny Wooden in Indiana. I want it. I want people to understand how growing up in Martinsville, how, you know, uh, uh, learning life lessons and also learning how to play and the importance of the environment uh, and basketball. And I mean, at the time when he played in 1920, their gym in Martinsville had 5,000 people. I mean, 5,000 <laughs> arena. That's where the, when I was in high school, that's where they played the sectionals every year because it was bigger than Bloomington High School's uh, you know, gym. That's so insane that that, yeah, in the in that little time, yeah, yeah, in 1923 or 27 is when they build it. Oh my God. And, uh, and, and also, uh, I hate to say this, but Purdue as well. And, uh, you know, his time in Indiana and how it shaped and formed him. I said, I have this vision of, 
of the movie ending with John Wooden getting on the plane and flying to L.A. to take the UCLA job. And that's where it stops, yeah. That's my a vision. I'm not saying that's necessarily, it's not my call. Yeah, but that's... The Wooden family is going to be, has say-so, they're involved in it, and... Uh, but I'm going to be involved with another writer who is a California writer who, I mean, lives in California. He's done extensive work. He's a very talented guy. But, uh, you know, we've had uh, a lot of discussions. But, you know, I, I will function as a, you know, a consultant more than anything, you know. That's great. Yeah. Well, I'm looking forward to that and seeing what, what comes of it. I had, and we can cut this, I had someone talk to me today about potentially a, a script you were excited about that has to do with... Um, uh, during they said the civil war but they weren't sure if that mm -hmm. was is mm -hmm. am i no is, it was actually a movie that was uh teed up and financed and ready to go in the fall and the actor strike um oh, uh, crushed us wow uh, man, we the, weren't able to complete the casting and uh we missed our window weather wise and then the it was pushed to the spring it was a Civil War coming of age ro slash romance based on a true story, an extraordinary true story. And uh, the, the financier, who's not in the film business, um, is in the medical device business, uh, decided he, I mean, well, he wanted to be part of the process. And he had already given a commitment that he was going to build a new factory to manufacture one of his products. And he you know, he's, he's a control guy. He wants to be there all the time. He couldn't do both. So... We pushed it to the fall, and we'll see. Maybe, okay, it, so maybe it'll happen. It may, well, it's it's there, but I don't know. You know, it's the film business. Yeah. It, it, I, I've always described getting a movie made. It's like uh, opening up a lock with 15 tumblers. I mean, you can get it to tumbler 13, 14. I've been to 14, and it didn't get, <laughs> you couldn't turn that final uh, thing over. Yeah. That's so. just the amount of frustration, I'm sure. Don't miss Constellation Stage and Screen's production of The Play That Goes Wrong. On stage March 21st through April 7th at the Waldron Arts Center. Monty Python meets Noises Off in this slapstick farce called The Funniest Play Broadway Has Ever Seen. It's comic gold that is sure to bring down the house. See The Play That Goes Wrong on stage March 21st through April 7th in downtown Bloomington. Find tickets at cconstellation.org. It's the nature but, of the game, well, you, you know. You, you you find you find out early on that you uh, you you have to take the the bad with the good, you know. You and we were so fortunate with our first two movies, and um, we've had a lot of. I mean, Hoosiers is my first script, and Rudy is my third script, but I've written forty four since, <laughs> and, and I've only gotten three of those made. And uh, you know what? The truth is. That's not a bad average, and 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 competing, knowing all the writers I know in L.A. <clears throat> uh, so um, you know, if you hit two hundred, I'm not not probably less than two. That's probably one fifty. Still, you know, I'm doing okay. Well, you know, it, I'm, it, uh, not I'm only getting, just yeah, sorry ahead. to cut you, not even to hit that, but like to have classics. What I mean, Hoosiers is yeah, that, been regarded never, as the best sports movie of all time. Well, we certainly we, you never can count on something like that. That yeah. just that's just uh, it, you know. David and I are, are still kind of shaking her. We, we we are just baffled by how that all happened. Yeah, you know? well, it's just like what a what a tease to have that be your first one. We're like, oh, this is easy. We got. The, well, we'll just be will, doing this I, all the I time. Will, I will say this, I, and and I'll, I'll share this in in terms of uh, context more than anything else. Our second movie is Rudy. So our first movie, who's your second movie, is Rudy. We thought. This film shit is <laughs> so easy. We, yeah. we have it nailed. It's, it's nuts, just not yeah. a bad problem. So uh, Philip Anschutz, one of the wealthiest you know people in the country, bought the MLS and um, Major League Soccer, and uh, and he made his money. He a Denver guy. I, I, I and so many different businesses, but um, you know he wanted to meet with us to do a soccer movie because it would help promote, and he wanted us to do a contemporary movie. I said, well, I'm. Not, one of the things that I've learned is I, I if I'm going to do a sports film, it, it, it's going to be based on a true story. You know, I, I don't want to be a figment of my imagination. So he said, well, find one. And I and I just happened to run into Jerry Eggley. And I said, you know, any good sports stories? And he told me soccer sports story. He told me a story about this um, team, uh, this World Cup team from the United States that was thrown together like in two weeks. 
And the first game they played was against the defending World Cup champion, and it was England, and they beat them. And what was considered, for the longest time, the greatest upset in the history of the World Cup. And I went, did a deeper dive, and the whole thing was fascinating because half the team were from the Italian neighborhood, the Hill in St. Louis. Okay. So uh, we went to him, and uh, he was, uh, you know, uh, he wasn't crazy about the idea, but he thought he we, we knew what we were doing. Well, let me tell you, um, whatever arrogance or conceit uh, we had uh, was crushed. <laughs> I mean, nothing will make you more humble in the world than this, uh, than the film business. Uh, everything that could have gone right went right in the first two movies and everything could have gone right went wrong in the, in the, in the third movie. It was like our, our good friend described it. He said, you two guys went to the Bank of Karma and found out your accounts had been overdrawn. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. So, yeah. So it was, it was, uh, it was again very, very humbling, and it gave me a totally different perspective. That uh, even with the the knowledge and experience of having these two films behind us, and convinced we knew what we were doing, there are certain elements that were totally out of our control. Yeah, uh, and and just got away from us, and the harder the. the we tried to dig out of the hole, the deeper the hole got. It was it was an insanely horrible experience. Did it ever end up coming out? Or? It did, but, yeah. you know, I don't want to go into it, it with great depth. It's not that I'm, I want to hide it. It's a whole different story. Our first cut was actually uh, tested very well. It was a two-hour and ten-minute cut. And uh, uh, we were pretty satisfied with this. And, and part of the problem was we had three different companies. He kept on changing his the various personnel and the presidents and the names of the companies. And the, the, uh, the new version of his filmmaking company, Walden Media, um, had an East and West. And their East guy came over and took off and consolidated the two. And um, he was, I think, one of my top two least favorite people I've ever run into in my life is a guy who had very little experience at all. And um, he was a hustler, a con man, and um, he could talk a good game. And I, I think that he pretended to know more than he did. And I mean, there's a follow-up story to this, but I'll just say this. He said to us, we came in, we met with him for the first time after the screening um, in Oklahoma City. And we said, we, we, we know that we have about seven to nine minutes that we can cut out, be around two hours. I mean, this will sing. He looked at us and said, uh, um, no, you need to take at least half an hour out. I said, if we take a half hour, it'll eviscerate the stories of, you know, it will, there won't be the movie, you know, we, that we wrote, that, we pl that I wrote, that we planned, that we made. I don't care. Take 30 minutes out. And David said, I'm not doing it. And he got up and walked out. And uh, and he said, well, you're going to do it? I said, no, I'm not going to do it. He said, okay, I will. So he hired his own editor, this guy, no filmmaking spirits. And the cut that was released, it was his cut. That was, that's, again, what can happen in terms of uh, uh, how you can really you know, have your, your dream get crushed by people like that. I mean, I'm, I'm getting filled with rage for you just <laughs> in this little, and that's, and I've known about it for two minutes. How many years did you spend on that? Oh, every movie takes at least, I mean, that was a whole year, maybe a little bit longer, but uh, just a quick follow-up story, just because yeah. you think about, I ended up doing a movie for Adam Sandler's company, uh, a NASCAR driver and, uh, and, uh, his partner uh, and roommate in, at NYU, uh, Adams, was uh, Jack Giopardo. And um, so uh, I had a great experience. I, you know, I, I got to drive tracks, you know, uh, oh, Daytona. And, what? Yeah, yeah, it was <laughs> incredible. Yeah. Hell yeah, man. Yeah. That's sick. So uh, anyway, um, uh, it was kind of the Michael Waltrip story in a way, you know, and, you know, growing up in the shadow of Daryl Waltrip. I don't know if you follow that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm not yeah. a ton, but enough okay. to know. Any, yeah. Anyway, the, the point is uh, the movie didn't get made for, you know, they 
it was for Columbia where Adam had an overall deal. They didn't think that, that NASCAR would fly uh, overseas. You know, they, you know, it was a really the Formula One people think, you know, they're a bunch of hail jacks. They, they intensely dislike like NASCAR. Yeah. <laughs> they tolerate IndyCar, but they intensely uh, dislike oh, NASCAR. I, yeah. They dismiss them and uh, they would stay away in protest in Europe. And you, you can't release a movie, uh, you know, at that time, certainly without an international market. So, um, it was, I think, I maybe 10 years ago or not. Yeah, it was, about, it was 2015, 2013. Uh, and I know it was right before I made uh, My All American. <clears throat> I got a call from Jack saying, and he was in business with another guy who um, they made holographs and um, they designed them for different museums and, and so on. And they just got this big job with the uh, Canton. Uh, Hall of Fame. Pro Football, Football yeah. Hall of Fame, yeah, and they, the the concept was to design these holographs for a locker room that was being built there, and it was Vince Lombardi and Bill Parcells and George House, the various you know, Hall, Hall of Fame, Fame coach. coaches, yeah. giving a locker room speech. Oh, wow. Okay, and they would bring in. They have benches, and the, the the you know the people there would sit on the benches and and get the locker room speech. And, wow. You know, he said, uh, "I want you to to write, you know, write those speeches because you know how to write locker room speeches." Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, um, I said, "This ah sounds like fun, sure." So I I drive over to Canton, right, and uh, uh, I walk in the meeting, and who's his partner? But the guy who cut the thirty minutes from the film. Oh, By the way, did he you just was turn right around. Uh, wait, wait, <laughs> wait a minute. First of all, I did turn around and I walked out. <laughs> okay, I did, I, and I said, like, "I refuse." Nope, nope. I know. I, I was, uh, and and I said, "Jack," and he said, "You didn't tell me." I said, "Well, there was a reason I didn't tell you because I heard the story." I said, "I'm done. I'm out of here." Yeah. No and uh, just give him a shot. Just give him a sh one conversation. What? There's nothing he could say that would, you know, uh, mitigate against the devastation that both Dave and I felt in terms of how he destroyed the film. And, um, it, it, you know, they were paying me a lot of money. And, it, and I was walking away from it. It was like 20 grand. I mean, for, you know, two days worth of work. So I thought that was a pretty, I was a, yeah, uh, but, I, but I was uh, how enraged I was. I was ready, ready to walk away from that. But I was, then I thought I never got a chance to lay into him. And let really know, let him know. How uh, I, so and that's worth more. Going, that's worth more I'm than going, twenty thousand dollars. I'm going to destroy this guy. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I agreed to meet with him. And before I get a word out, the guy was. I was an idiot. I'm so sorry. It was one of the worst things I've ever done. I thought I knew was everything that I just said about him. He admitted to before I could even say it. So. Whether it was manipulative or whether, whether it was, you know, uh, because he was out of the business, by the way. He got fired, like, oh. you know, a year later. Because cool. he had no and, idea and, what he was doing. And yeah. nobody, I mean, I don't, he never landed on his feet anywhere. So, I mean, that was his gig, doing holographs, you know. That was a big coming, coming yeah. down. So <laughs> he humbled, was, humbled him a little he bit. Was, yeah. He was, as I said, the film business can humble yeah. you really fast. <laughs> and so, um, but he did, like, an extended mea culpa. And uh, to the point where it's not like... So I stayed on, but, and he, we would go out to dinner the, that, those two nights and uh, I, I still wouldn't talk to him. <laughs> I, <you know? laughs> yeah. He would try to engage me with conversation and I'd just cut him off. You know, I, I'm here. That's enough. Yeah. I don't need to do anymore. Don't any push more. it, buddy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah that's yeah. right. Yeah. I took we're your, not, we're I, not going to become buddies. Yeah. 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 We're not yeah. hanging out. Yeah. We're not drinking buds. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You did your groveling. Yeah. That's the only reason I'm here. Yeah. Right. And I appreciate that. I love, my favorite part is. Before you even said it, whenever someone like takes a pause like you did before you described him, I knew you were about to be like, this guy sucks. Like, cause you're like, this guy, how do I, and whenever you take that pause, you're like, mm -hmm. you're about to just be like, how am I, how do I say this nicely mm -hmm. while still conveying like how much I hate this person? Yeah. 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 That's it. That's it. Um, well, that's, I, so we talked about how you might have so to So by the way, the, the the name of the movie is called The Game of Their Lives. And okay. I, and I yeah. think you could still rent it somewhere. Yeah. Not, I don't think it's ever been on streaming. And when Disney got the distribution, um, they ended up changing the name of the movie because they had another 
film that sounded like it called The Greatest Game Ever Played, which is a golf film. So they changed it to, I don't, re- I, I'm blanking out. Did I, you, I, did you watch it front to back once and then never again? I had to because yeah, I, yeah. Be, you be, wanted to know well, they- no, no, it wasn't that because, uh, okay, here was the, here was the other situation. When we started off, there were at least 10 producers, okay, on it. When, when we had our rough cut that we screened, um, David walked and he did not have anything to do with the, the, the movie until the very end, the final mix. But um, I was the only producer left. So if I would have given up on the movie, then no one would have been there to supervise the post-production. So I would, you know, I was in music spotting and did all the kinds of things. I mean, post-production is a six-week, two-month process where you you lay in the sound, uh, you lay in the soundtrack and and dubbing and looping and, 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 and effects and so on. So I really had in the color balancing of the film. And, uh, you know, so for about a month, I was the only person there to do that. So I was watching that film every day and just, I was sick to my stomach oh, every day. What it was just, torture. It was torture. Yeah. But again, I mean, these are your babies, you know, even though they've been damaged, you got to do what you can to give them the most health you can for them to, you, then you have this, some sense that they may survive. But I knew the movie that went out there was, 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 was a damaged film. Um, but you know, there's some people like it and got some good reviews and, uh, you know, it's, if they only knew what it could have been. Yeah. 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 It's full potential. Yeah. The actual, instead of, you know, the 90 minute to actually do the 120, mm-hmm. get the, uh, the full character development, the stories, mm-hmm. um, not just yeah. shallow, you know? Yeah. Yeah. The Bloomington town planner is a community calendar owned and published by local residents, John and Sharon Martin mailed out to Bloomington homes in December of each year. It features school schedules and community events. And don't forget the coupons at the bottom of the calendar. They'll save you money and help you decide on the next restaurant or retail Taylor to check out here in the Bloomington area. Town Planner also has an online calendar, which will be found at townplanner.com. Make sure to sign up for their weekly e-newsletter so you can stay on top of all the fun events going on around town. We were talking about how you, if you ever need to talk to that and you'd be like, who is this guy? Uh, this might be the moment. Um, <laughs> so I've been, my friends have roasted me for a long time about I've never seen the Goonies or like there's some of these movies that are classics that I've never seen. I've seen Hoosiers plenty of times, but I never watched Rudy. Mm-hmm. Until last night. Oh my gosh! I really? Know. Is that yeah. not? Please don't walk out. Well, oh, I was, no, no, <laughs> no. I was I, so like, I was like, man, Age was gonna kill me. Uh, no, but it was just one I, of those. I don't care. I know, yeah. but it was like it was just one of those where yeah. it had just slipped through the cracks. I was three years old when it came out, but yeah. even I played football, and yeah. I'm from Indiana. There's yeah. no dude that I'm again. I'm sure you get this all the time. I'm I'm so filled with regret that I never had not watched it sooner. And when you were talking about the coach speeches, I'm picturing Sean Asik getting up on that, um, on the stool. And mm-hmm. like, dude, I was, I've, I've, there are very few movies that like have ever gotten me to tear up because mm-hmm. I'm usually still like, oh, it's still a movie. I saw that. I legit, like, it is crazy because no one died or, you know, <laughs> well, uh, early on. But you know what I mean? Normally at the end, mm-hmm. something to get that kind of visceral reaction out of you mm-hmm. is going to be something like that. But it's like, no, it's just a guy getting in a football game. Yeah. And it just moves you so much because mm-hmm. the entire movie is just him getting just beaten down, beaten down, mm-hmm. beaten down. And when you're talking about the music placement, the music, I, I mm-hmm. think, is so key in that movie. It really is. Where yeah. it's coming in. Yeah. And, um, yeah, there's, I have so many things to tell you about my thoughts on it, but it was like, I thought you'd get a kick out of that. And I was just, uh, it was, it was so freaking good, man. It's so obvious, like why it's such a, such a classic. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, so here's something, um, that's, uh, may be of interest to you, uh, <clears throat> in all the movies that David and I have done together, we've never been allowed to release the cut that we wanted to. It, we, 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 that we were happy with. Really? Okay. On the, on the first uh, Hoosiers cut, the cut that we wanted to do really badly was two hours and 28 minutes long. And it was, the studio insisted they were not going to release a movie longer than two hours. And with Rudy, it was, I believe it was two hours and 15 or 16 minutes that we thought was the cut we really wanted. And, um, and that tested really well, but they had the same thing. They had a rule no longer than two hours. They, it was an old kind of rule that 
for kind of these these kind of movies that were not directed by you know Scorsese or something like that or or Francis Coppola, um, uh, they wanted to turn three showings a night. You know, so that's why they wanted another two hours. Interesting. So. See, I thought it had more to do with like the audience's attention span or something. No, like that. actually, it was you know getting more tickets. Yeah, you know, selling was, more popcorn. Oh, yeah, so yeah. things were just yeah. determined so, by yeah. money. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, who would have uh, thought? What, what, yeah. <laughs> Shocking. Right? Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. I mean, that's the, the, the artistic integrity of the actual <laughs> film, zilch. But what's going to bring in the most money? Yeah, but but uh, <laughs> so um, Sony pictures that was we released through TriStar that's a Sony company um, approached David this summer and said uh, would you like to do a director's cut so um, he did it and we uh, the, it's actually it was released um, on a DVD about a, a six weeks ago or something like that oh wow and uh, uh, we have a, a audio commentary throughout the entire movie and it's a two hour and 15 or 16 minute uh, version of it, uh, and uh, and you're going to write this down um, because they're going to screen it at the IU Cinema April 18th. Boom, we're okay. there. <laughs> what is that? That's, you, uh, you that's, be, you that's better, a Thursday, isn't it? I, think. I don't yeah. know. Yeah, I think yeah, April 18th yeah. is a Thursday. Okay. Yeah, I know because so, we're doing yeah. an event on it anyway. Uh, that's so cool. I mean, yeah. One, I've actually I've never gone to the IU Cinema. No, um, my gosh, it's, it, it, they, it's phenomenal. They have one of the best projection systems in the state, I've if heard, not the best. I've heard know. nothing but incredible things. I'm really yeah. outing myself uh, on this uh, episode here. Never been to IU Cinema. I had never seen Rudy. Um, so yeah. this is this is going to be a case where when we see it, David and I see it at the IUC on April 18th, we will have never seen it look as good ever as it will on April 18th. Wow. Because what they now have because of 4K and their ability to project that 4K, the detail is so precise. It's just, it, it'll blow you away. That's so exciting. Yeah, yeah. I'm 100% there. That's, I can't wait. And <laughs> okay. Are they projecting your commentary with it too? No. Okay. No, that would be, <laughs> I mean, that, that would be way too much. The look that, of pure disgust on your face. I can't tell if you looked more disgusted then or when you're talking about the guy from Walden Media. Well, I just wanted to make sure. Um, if I was in the audience, I, my reaction would be, will you please shut up? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I like, want to watch the movie. Who the hell are these guys? Uh, what so I so it, it, it's actually a two disc set. And the audio commentary is on a second disc. Or, or, can, or I think you can turn it on and off, you know, whatever. And you can just find it online? It's on Am in Amazon. Amazon? Yeah. yeah. The weird thing about this is, um, I don't know if, if you... Uh, so I, they sent me a bunch of them. I can't play them on my DVD player. You need a special 4K DVD player in order to play 4K DVDs. And... 95% that Aren't are out the, there are not. That's annoying as hell. Well, most people don't have DVDs because there's no point. Or I know, for yeah, them. yeah. Right. I don't have a DVD player anymore. Yeah, yeah. so uh, I, I, they have still not made a deal uh, to with a streaming company. And that's what everybody's kind of waiting for. Because, right. uh, you know, uh, listen, they they uh, they send out um, Netflix and Amazon and, and YouTube TV. They're all 4K. Yeah. So, you know, it would look, it'll look great when they finally do. Sony is the only studio that doesn't have their own streaming service. So I, I, I think they're just waiting to, so, to find the best deal. Yeah, that's super exciting for when that comes out. I, there was um, a couple of the other interesting things about Rudy, I thought, was I saw that like Notre Dame had never, because I saw like the thank yous to Town of South Bend. I thought it was funny that Lou Holtz was, you know, one of the thank yous. And what, you, uh, Notre Dame hadn't let anyone record there since like 1940 or something? 1948. It yeah. was Newt Rockney, all, my All-American. And what was interesting, uh, it was a 52-year gap, you know, between Newt Rockney, All-American, and, and our film. And uh, since then, no Zay films whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> well, at this point, it's like you're not going to top it. So what well, are you Well, I mean, other people have proposed and, you know, uh, petitioned to shoot other films besides football movies on that campus, to right. utilize their campus. And they... They keep on saying no. Wow, that's pretty cool. Yeah, because, um, yeah, so what, did you shoot it in 90? You said 52 year. I know it came out in 93. We shot it in 93 uh, and came out in 94. Or maybe, oh, okay. Yeah, I think that. I think we shot it in 93 and came out in 94. Gotcha. Yeah, it yeah. was. Um, and then the other thing I thought was interesting, and it, maybe I didn't know on the credits, you because the show's written by, mm -hmm. you know, Angelo Pizza when it first starts. 
But then at the end of the credits, your name isn't on there until it says like second unit director mm -hmm. way down the list. And it's, uh, that's I thought what, it was no, but that's a, that's a, that's a guild uh, requirement. And it's oh, nothing, okay. They have nothing to do with anything. Yeah. Uh, the same was thing was true at Hoosiers. I was a second yeah. unit director on Hoosiers. Okay. Too. So yeah. what does that even well, mean? Well, it means you have a, like a, a, a camera crew that go out and pick up scenes that uh, are non-dialogue scenes. So like wa him walking through the campus, birds flying, you know, off the, you know, it, it, it's, it's part of montage, the montage yeah. look. So for Hoosiers, it was them getting on the bus. I mean, the bus traveling against uh, the countryside uh, with corn stalks in the backfield. Yeah. yeah. Everything that doesn't have dialogue. Interesting. Is second unit. And also, uh, you know, technically I had my own crew with the bigger scenes in, but, but, but David still controlled the cameras if we were shooting basketball. Interesting. I, one of the other things I, I thought was cool was that um, the classroom scenes were all over in Brown County in Nineveh for, for Hoosiers. Is that right? It was said it was. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the, we couldn't find, or we actually did find the perfect town and uh, called Waveland. Uh, and we, uh, it was the, it was the town square, the, the school and the gym were just what we were looking for. And we went and asked if we could shoot there. And they said, well, they're going to tear, tear the school down and build a new one. And the bond, you know, had already been done. They couldn't do anything about it. I don't think they took us seriously. I didn't think they, we thought we were some. Doing you know, some small. Yeah, film, exactly. Film yeah, yeah, yeah exa exactly. Yeah. And um, you're like, do you know who Gene Hackman is? Did you pull that on him? <laughs> no, uh, you know, I, know. I, I don't know if Gene was even attached to that oh, point. Okay, but, yeah, but, yeah. but the point is, because we couldn't find everything in one place, we had to kind of knit together um, um, the, the gym and from Knightstown, Knightstown yep. and then the town square in New Richmond. Uh, and then the school was at Nineveh. Yeah. Unfortunately, no longer there. Yeah. Let's say uh, the magic of filmmaking, you know, it yeah. all, make it all seem it like make, one place where yeah, you're going right. all over. And that's uh, right. Are you always been pretty involved in like, uh, what is it? Site scouting or. Oh, very much. Yeah. yeah. So the way in which Dave and I work together is we, we kind of do everything together, you know, and I'm in every casting decision on every location scout and, uh, you know, we're together and picking out uniforms and wardrobe. And, you know, I, look, here's the, the kind of official title. I'm the producer of this film. I hired David. Yeah. So it's like he <laughs> technically works for me. He's there on my behest. Let's get this straight. Okay. They, and, 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 now, yeah. Okay. And now, now, David, da David and I are roommates from college. Well, okay? yeah, you yeah. met in a uh, we uh, fraternity, right? Yeah, yeah. we were Sigma Nu. So. I mean, we our, our friendship goes so far back. You know, we're we're like an old married couple. We we just, uh, uh, you know, it, it 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 worked out. You know, David has certain strengths uh, as a filmmaker that complement my strengths. You know, he's he's not as strong in certain areas. I'm not as strong in certain areas, and kind of it kind of worked. It's great. That's uh, that's Garrett and I. We're like a bickering married couple, <laughs> and uh, his strengths are my weaknesses, and vice versa. Yeah. Um, did you? So, how did you develop this talent to be able to just tell sports stories and um, just so well? Like, did you play organized sports? Again, speaking of questions, I'm sure you've been asked a million times. But did you play organized sports growing up? I did. Uh, you know, mostly uh, little league baseball. I mean, then grade school, middle school, football and baseball and and basketball. Um, I would say that I was uh, as an athlete um, uh, average. Um, I had speed, but I didn't have great hand eye coordination, you know, which was and I see that in my son, who's got everything I don't have. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I wasn't strong like my other son is. You know, I didn't have this kind of, you know, fast twitch muscle thing going on. Uh, you know, and I was I was small, and uh, and um, and so I played football. I, I didn't make the team uh, at University High School uh, as a freshman. And I didn't make it as a sophomore and I never tried out again. But uh, I was on the football team as a freshman and sophomore. Then I got kicked out, uh, kicked off the team for fighting twice oh, in, in, in games. Uh, real, against yeah. the opponents? Yeah. 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 What, what got you all fired up? Do you remember? I, I, I just, I, I, I was an angry teenager. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I had a lot of, I had a I had lot of anger going out. on. Yeah. yeah. I was very rebellious. I, you know, I, I, I tried to, 
describe to people in the simplest ways. I, I was the I was the perfect child until I hit the eighth grade, and uh, I don't think I ever made a B. I I was I did everything that my mother wanted me to do. I I saluted her generalship, and um, then I didn't. And then I went totally the other way. Did not join a. If you look at my you know the yearbook of my senior year, you know all this club, that club, this sport, that club, zero. And I graduated 112th out of 135. I graduated with like a D average. I was, and there was not a college that I could have gotten into except Indiana has a law and on the books that if you graduate with, if you have a high school, accredited high school degree, they have to give you one semester on probation. So I was let in for one semester on probation. Now it, that, that still is the rule, but it's not for Bloomington. You, it would be a regional school. Okay. Yeah. But then you made the most out of that semester. I yeah I did I yeah. did pretty well yeah. because, <laughs> and, and 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 for the wrong reasons. So I joined a fraternity, and I realized going to all these sorority parties, I have to stay here. <laughs> <laughs> That's my motivation was girls. Yeah. Honestly. So what yeah, we're telling was, everyone is don't try in school. Doesn't matter. <laughs> Uh, and just be motivated by women. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I was, that was 18. Okay? No, I know, I know, I We've grown and we've learned <laughs> since then. Yeah. Yeah, and then you ended up uh, going to the USC film school. Is that I did. correct? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And then how, um, you ended up coming back to Bloomington, how long ago was it? It's been, you've 2006. been 2006. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And um, was that just uh, to come back to kind of raise your, raise your kids here? It was the... By far, the number one reason was that uh, my wife at the time uh, and I were not happy with the school system where we lived. And it was teeming with drugs and the, the one private school uh, was a mess that was there. And it was she and she never liked Southern California anyway. And I knew how great a town um, Bloomington is to raise kids. I mean, you don't have to talk about the importance of education if, you know, your friends or sons and daughters are professors and, you know, which is the case. And you have, you have teachers at Bloomington North and South who have doctorates. I mean, you, it just, it, they're like private schools in some ways. Yeah. And uh, so when they were seven and 10, we moved back there for, for them for more than anything. But uh, I didn't kind of recognize or, or realize what benefits would accrue to myself and her way back here. I mean, I, I honestly didn't miss it except for food and uh, and the winners. <laughs> <laughs> well, so the you've always known Bloomington for good food, then? No, I miss the food uh, in LA. Uh, I, yeah, I, 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 I thought no, I, I got I, that mix around. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean. Now, we lived in Santa Monica for a long time, and um, there's so many great seafood restaurants that oh, they just ca well, they just pull it off the docks, you know. Yeah, and, uh, you just, can't even uh, compete. Oh, my no God. Chance. Yeah, and uh, the great sushi restaurants. and right. I mean, it's a food city. Yeah, you know. L.A. is a phenomenal food city. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, and I was, I, w I hate the word foodie. I wasn't that, but I did follow, you know, the, the restaurants that were, you know, we kind of all... I had friends who were into the chefs and the restaurants. We we went, we tried them all. It was it was fun, and you know, you get to Bloomington and it, nothing, just, Not, uh, nothing. Yeah, yeah. The yeah. only place that actually stood up to any was Dave Talent's restaurant. Yeah, that was high level stuff. Oh, it was you know? incredible. It real. I missed that place. Yeah, yeah. it was. Um, I've gone over and you know, I do bingo at the vault where mm -hmm. he kind of helped develop the menu, and he's been with Champions Catering for yeah. a while now. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, restaurant talent was, oh. I have I feel kind of like an idiot now looking back at my younger self, but I'd go sit at the bar in basketball shorts, which I feel like might be, might have been disrespectful to uh, it's what they were it's doing. It's Bloomington. It yeah, but matter. I just yeah. like, again, I've always, even then I shouldn't have, didn't afford, couldn't really afford, but I was serving bartending and, yeah. you know, I was like, I want to go have a nice meal yeah. and that's how I've always spent my money Yeah, is on going out to eat, getting nice meals, sure. having that experience. And I would love to, I think I maybe sat at a table in there once. It mm -hmm. was usually me going to my, myself sit at the bar top and being like let's let's see what dave's doing today yeah and it's uh man that yeah a few things that have come along since then yeah so, so to give you context of this uh, as i said i still go to uh um wine tastings and uh they had a wine tasting big red 
and they had a feature winemaker from a, a great winery, a, a family that goes back 80 years, Clay Moritzen from Moritzen Wine, and um, make great, great sins. And, uh, and, and I asked him what he's doing here, and he said, well, he got to know Dave Talent, and he would come back and do wine dinners with him. And he said, let me tell you something. I, I hope you guys in Bloomington appreciated him because we have – you know, some of the best chefs in Sonoma County <laughs> that uh, from all over the world, yeah. you know, and we have wine dinners. His stuff matches any of them. Wow. You know, that that's that's how talented he is, how day, talented yeah, he is. I know. So. It's so impossible yeah. not to have the pun. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, it's, uh, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, I'm glad he has something that obviously he likes. He's been there for a while, but yeah. I like, I almost feel like it's being waste. Where like I don't know, maybe it's just because I. I'd love it's to see. His, it's uh, it's a grind to do what he was doing every night, you know. Yeah. And, and, and he and Chrissy, it was uh, it was it was it was it was hard, you know. And uh, and and now he has more control over his life. I think. I mean, you can. You should ask him to come in. in I've, I've tried. I've okay. reached out. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think I may have only emailed him once, uh -huh. but I have never tried using any back channels of. You know, mutual friends or anything. I'm trying like to make that. him feel bad. Why do you have this job when you could be cooking? Yeah, for yeah, us? you're, yeah, yeah. That's very <laughs> self, yeah, selfish of you. The rest of us are suffering yeah, because why you, are want, you, doing this you want a balanced thing. life. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> why, why, why are you having cooking private meals for the president of, uh, you know, Indiana University yeah. <laughs> when, when you could let us all share? Yeah, think about yeah. the little folks here. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> do you think there's been anywhere that's come along since then that's come close? No, I, I don't. I mean, I happen to like Feast, and I'll tell you why I like Feast. I think their concept of being able to pull a bottle off the wall and and ha and being charged only like five dollars for the wine glasses uh, is fantastic because it does drive me crazy when when restaurants double or double and a half, you know, wine that uh, doesn't deserve. I you know. If I can go to Kroger and get a really good fifteen dollar bottle of wine, and then I go into a restaurant, see it's for sixty. Yeah, I'm not interested. I, it just it always has bugged me, you know. Well, Especially if it's a really kind of boutique wine that I wouldn't have ordinarily I can't get or wouldn't have gotten. And I mean that's different. But if it's kind of a, a wine that's pretty accessible, yeah, it's like oh, Chateau Saint Michel it, Riesling. Yeah, yeah, I can, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, they don't. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you 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 got the right idea but but their their selection at feast is phenomenal and eric does a good job i think he's a really good chef uh, i'm a, i'm a fan and i think elm does a good job too you know um i i'm 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 happy with them for the most yeah. part yeah. Have you, did you ever make it over to small favors i did yeah i, I wasn't quite i i, I knew what he was i i, I appreciate what he was doing and really trying to kind of break the fourth wall so to speak and and force people's palate to taste something different and pushing the envelope, all those yeah. different phrases. And I appreciated that, but not everything worked for me. I can say that now that yeah. they're not open because I'd like to support local businesses whenever I can. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I had, I mean, they were my favorite spot um, yeah. up until, you know, they yeah, I'd closed. Get it. Yeah. But, and they had a great, wine, there, great there, wine list too. Yeah. It, yeah. But there were some misses, but I, that's yeah. what I love so much is that it was. They so tried. Risky. Yeah. It they tried. So yeah, he, yeah, very original. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's just like, I, yeah. it was just so refreshing to me. And, uh, but yeah, I love Elm. I love Feast. And yeah. we were talking about it. We both got to be judges for the Bloomington Chefs Challenge. Right. Where we had Corbin Morwick from One World, right. uh, we had Eric uh, from Feast, and we had mm -hmm. Dan Thomas from uh, from Elm, and that was so much fun. It was you, myself, uh, Stacy, who runs the culinary program at Ivy Tech, right. and I can't remember the guy's name, but he was the owner of the farm that supplied the carrots, which was the secret ingredient. Yeah, I see him every I see him every weekend at the farmers market. Oh, okay, yeah. he's always yeah. setting up down yeah. there. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. I um, but that was such a fun, cool experience, and for me, that I feel like that was my like. It doesn't get any better from this, from being like a local food guy. Yeah. Just being able to be on the stage at the Buskirk. It was fun. And yeah. uh, it was just such a, so phenomenal. And yeah, we were talking about it a little bit before we started recording about just like, we're like, neither of us are chefs. Like yeah. we're up here judging people and uh, <laughs> you, <laughs> it feels kind of silly. But at the end of the day, we do no good food because we go out and we eat good food. So at the that's what we're going to judge is what's put in front of us. How is it presented? How does it taste? Season 5 of the No Dishes Podcast is brought to you by VisitBloomington.com.
Visit Bloomington.com is the best resource for restaurant and culinary information, special events, fun activities, places to stay, and more in our area. We share a similar mission here on the No Dishes podcast of highlighting local businesses and the people who make our community unique. We can't thank them enough for hopping on board. Check them out at visitbloomington.com to easily plan your next meal, visit, or night out on the town. Yeah, I mean, I, we didn't try to pass ourselves off as professionals. No, right? not no. one bit. Yeah, I hope I didn't. Yeah, <laughs> no, we did. Yeah, you know, I was like, <laughs> no, well, they knew I wasn't a professional. Right, that, yeah, that's yeah. not my work, right? That's what I, not what I do. I just eat. Yeah, yeah. You're like, I'm here for the food. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Let me know when they're done cooking. Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, that was very, very close. Dan ended up winning. Eric got a uh, very close, close second. second. And yeah. Corbin also uh, did an incredible job, too. Yeah. And, it's, uh, even if you don't know what they're doing, just seeing them in action. Oh, you're, you're very impressed. impressive. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. And they're just doing it on the fly, yeah. which is nuts. And then it just raises um, a ton of money for a great cause. Too. Absolutely. Um, one of the things I thought that was interesting with you being like, you don't have good hand-eye coordination, is that you're still a member of the Indiana Basketball Hall of Fame, <laughs> dis despite that. <laughs> Is that a, do you feel like you maybe are one of the least athletic people relative to who else is in there? I, I mean, I don't, I mean, they do have a category that is, you know, those who contributed to. Gotcha. Okay. Whatever, you know, yeah. and some of that, I, I think, um, I don't know, what, I, I can't remember the exact phrase, but under my category, our category, we're also reporters uh, or play-by-play -play people. I think Tom Carnegie or something like that. Yeah. Was in there. And, you know, I don't know what kind of athletes they are either. But, so I can't say that. Like, yeah, I can't say categorically I'm probably the least athletic. Yeah, you're like, I got and, some and of these guys beat. And, 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 yeah. <laughs> I mean, if obviously, um, you know, I was. No, that was, it was a poorly phrased question. That was, uh, I, th I, I thought it was interesting. Someone that, you know, maybe didn't play collegiate ball. Uh, but you're making Didn't it in play there. high school ball. Yeah. 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 Um, but that's got to be a pretty cool. Is that you ever pull that out as like a fun fact? No, <laughs> never. <laughs> I don't think you have to. You've got no. Enough. I mean, uh, it, it, th th that would give me no actual street cred because, you know, it was conditional, you know, to get in. You don't get in as a regular member member, although I, they don't I don't know if they distinguish it or not, but it's a separate category. Uh, than it is for the, the real players. Yeah. Do you have, I think, uh, I'm sure you've been asked a million times, do you have a favorite between Hoosiers and Rudy? Do you have one that you like more? No, I, I have, I've been asked that a few times. I but, figured uh, you have been. I, but, yeah, um, I'm trying to be as unoriginal as possible. So it's, <laughs> it, it's like, uh, it, and, and the way in which I describe it and, and um, is that they're both like your children. I mean, you, you, you love them, you know, unconditionally in the same way. But my experiences with both were very different. And to some extent, Hoosiers has a greater meaning for me because it was my first movie. And Dave and I really, it was his first movie. And we were just flying by the skin of our teeth. I think we said to each other at least every day, once every day, we're going to, this is, this is going to bury our career forever. This is not working. At all. <laughs> we have, and Gene Hackman was constantly telling us we had no idea what we were doing. <laughs> That's going to make he was, you feel he good. He was telling us, this is why he said, one time we came out, he looked at, uh, it was the barbershop scene. He saw these, what is this dog pants? We got little Abner going to jump out here. And, uh, am I, do I, did I get caught in a amateur night in Dixie production? I mean, he was just like, <laughs> He was just roasting he was, you. He was totally roasting us and not not joking. Not playful. Yeah, yeah. No. He was just like, he was, what the hell he am was, I doing he here? He was worried. He was very concerned, which made us concerned because what the hell do we know? Yeah. You know, maybe uh, yeah. he's right. He's established. Yeah. yeah. So we just kind of put our head down and hoped that it all cut together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. we, you know, and by the way, I don't care how experienced you are, I don't care if you're Scorsese or Spielberg. It, it, they don't know how it's going to come together and they don't know how re our audience will respond to that film until they get it in front of an audience. And, um, I mean, Spielberg has actually said some of the films I've made that I thought were going to be, had the biggest impact on, on the audience didn't have much at all or not what I expected. They kind of just were like a souffle that never rose. 
And then there were other films that I was not really sure. I didn't know if it would, I don't know, are people going to get it? Are they going to, is it going to work? Is it going to, uh, you know, and, and they became huge, you yeah. know? Uh, so you, you just, you just don't know. You try to do the best you can and, and, and keep going forward. Yeah. And maybe just stick to like what your conviction is and then just hope that what you think is right is what other people. Yeah. Are I mean, as to. I mentioned, one of the things about being a producer, director, you know, David and I, and, and when I did my all American, I was, I was, I was the sole director is that, um, you're making hundreds of decisions every day. Someone's coming up to you with a tie class. Should I use this or this or that? I mean, literally, it, it and that's your job because it's your vision that you're trying, you're putting up there. You're responsible for everything. Does the sash on this curtain work? You know, that kind of, I mean, you try to do a lot of the work beforehand, but sometimes you have to scramble and you have to change locations and then, you know, it becomes more and more. And that's not even talking about working with actors because they have questions and they, you know, and they need to have precise uh, interpretations of line readings and emotional textures and tones. And yeah, it's uh, and and not to speak of the most important communications between as a director between you and the cinematographer. You know, how, how are we going to capture this on film? So I always my attitude when I go in there <clears throat> is and David's pretty much the same way it, is that um I have a vision. I know what I see. I know what I want. But a lot of times you get there and things change. You know, a, an actor finds a moment that kind of changes the tenor of the tone of the scene and the emotional point. Uh, so I have to either scramble and change the dialogue a little bit or I have to, um, um, I have to be uh, flexible and, and open. And a lot of times it's not what happens on the set it's how I approach, how I, uh, I describe to every actor and every key on, on all the, the, in all the crews and cinematographer most particularly, I know what I want and I'm open to a better idea. And that's the, really the power of collaboration. And you have to let them know that you're real and not just bullshitting. You know, I really want to hear your ideas. And I also say, I will respond in one of three ways. One, that's a great idea. I wish I had thought about it. Two, I'm not sure. I'm not playing you. I'm just really not sure. I have to think about it. I have to process it and think about what, what that, how that affects other things. And three, immediately I know it's wrong. It yeah. doesn't work. But, you know, give them a sense of dignity. And when I say no, that I'm, I'm not personalizing them and yeah. the rejection. So that's kind of the, that's the best way. I, I watched some of the directors that I admired when I worked in development um, the, how they worked and I kind of modeled myself or, uh, after them. I've got one of the things I was thinking about is how difficult it has to be. I, obviously you have this vision and you have this story, but writing dialogue, you mentioned mm -hmm. it, like just how do you even, cause I feel like if I tried to write Gar dialogue or Garrett or like, it's just going to not sound natural and it's just going to sound so, you know what I mean? Like, how do you even start from just nothing mm -hmm. and get this dialogue, especially in Rudy? Again, it's so fresh in my mind. It's such good dialogue. That's mm -hmm. like a little quippy, but still like seems real. You get lost in it. What, what is that process like? So I guess the best way of describing, there's two ways of answering this question. One is that... Um, before I'd ever written a script, before I wrote Hoosiers, I really kind of had this idea that somehow outlining the story was the way to go. Because I'd worked with other writers, as, as I said, I, was in, I worked at various studios as a development executive. <clears throat> and, um, and I thought really laying out the sequence of the stories and the character development and having it all in front of you was the way to go until I started writing myself. And then I ran up against the various thing that you're sort of implying, which was, I don't really know who these guys are or these girls are, or these, these women are, unless I start writing dialogue. And when I start writing dialogue, something emerges that is um, uh, dimensional. It makes them more than I'm moving stick figures around or chess pieces around. Uh, and and other people have said this um, that um, you know if you really lock into a character's voice, they help you tell the story, and they help guide you. 
because they become they become real to you. When I think about how I'm going to tell the story and uh, from the outside in, I'm using my right brain or left brain, uh, my my left brain, which is a logical, linear, analytical um, side of my brain, objective. And then, but I write. I I I I've learned that I can only write effectively from my right brain, which is instinctive, subjective, emotional, and it's almost like I I I say. I process how I'm going to write it uh, before I write it from the chakras from my neck up. But when I write it, the chakras from my, my neck down are at work. You know, it's my gut, my heart, my feel. It's it just, and um, I'll give you an example of, uh, of, of how things can happen where, where outlines, why I never use an outline again. Uh, and that is, <clears throat> I was 30 pages into the script and I was trying to figure out how am I going to um, have distinctively have the coach connect to the players? I don't want it all to be the same. And I came up with uh, an idea of somebody that I knew who had a father who was an alcoholic who had walked on the field one time and started arguing with the referee in a football game. He was drunk. And I just remember how embarrassed this guy was. And, uh, so I thought maybe I'll just have one of these guys kind of just have a father who's a drunk and comes on the floor and, you know, the coach becomes this sort of surrogate father because this guy is just, you know, but I'm just, he was just a device. Yeah. So the character shooter was simply a device who was going to come on the floor and we're maybe never see him again, or maybe we would, I, I left that open. And then they started immediately. The voice came to me of shooter. I don't know why. Sometimes voices come to you and sometimes they don't. For example, you mentioned Rudy. I couldn't quite get Rudy's father's voice down because he 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 came from he had East European background, but it, it, there was a slight accent, but it didn't quite work when I worked with accents. I worked and I worked and I worked. The speech where he gives them um, at the bus stop before he leaves to go off, I rewrote that. 20 times trying to find his voice and i finally did but the, and and thank god for you know the actor we hired uh, but uh um the uh <clears throat> in the case of shooter when um uh, when he goes on the court and starts arguing i was just initially conceptually i was going to have the, the referee just kick him out he was going to be carried out by security guard but then i thought you know my coach wouldn't tolerate that he's going to go out and, and go right into his face and when that happened i felt like there was a connection in, in a weird sort of way only in retrospect did i look back and think they were both seen connecting through their shadows their dark side and uh i thought you know what maybe there's something there with this character that will bring something out in each one of these guys that will help them uh, you know, moving forward and where they're stuck in their lives. It was just an idea. And so I, as an experiment, I wrote a scene following this with him in the coffee shop and that's, that scene's in the movie. Yeah. And I, and it's almost like I couldn't keep shooter out of the movie. Yeah. yeah. You and know. okay. So here's the, the real payoff. That character was nominated for a best Academy supporting Academy award. Wow. How about that? Yeah. With, and never in an outline. Oh man. So yeah. <laughs> that's so on it. That's so fascinating to me because it's again, I just like it's such it's so mind blowing to me that you could put yourself in. OK, I'm this person. OK, I'm this person and just have it, it to all come together. So it, it's not. It, it, uh, and this is something that I can't quite describe. I think it is because um, I I probably read a thousand scripts before because that was my job was to read, analyze, find writers, work, you know, make connections with the. Uh, you know, when directors had, had a great idea and they wanted to find a writer, we, we bought their idea for our company. And and um, and and there were there were a lot a lot of writers that I read that were really smart and that had, you know, um, well laid out, entertaining scripts. But one of the one of the faults was that all the voices sounded alike. You know, oh, they, yeah, yeah, all, yeah. they all sound like that guy, the person that's yeah, writing it. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Even the women sound like. Yeah. The <laughs> so here was my yeah, here like was how? my here was my trick starting out. Uh, I was trying to how do I how do I create characters um, without giving them backstory? All oh, that biography thing. I've never done that. But um, 
I, and I haven't done this since, but it was a trick that I used that worked. I thought about my teammates on my um, uh, eighth grade basketball team. And so each one of them are, are there, there was an Ollie McPike uh, on my team, you know, yeah, there was, wow. there, there was a Jade Butcher was Ray Butcher. So I had, I gave all of these different characters um, their voices from my eighth grade. Back. That's so, that's <laughs> I, when I was going to ask that was how much do you draw from real life? Just well, like- I, again, um, you know, any writer will tell you that there's a part of you, you know, we all have feminine sides. So you, you writing when you're writing a female part, you know, you're writing from your feminine side, your experience with, with your mother and your sisters, but also all of your mates, you know, yeah. throughout your life and all the people you interact with. And so it really comes from a, a your subconscious or unconscious. It comes from a different kind of place to tap into that, you know, and it, and it's, that's why I think it's impossible to teach writing. I, I do, uh, because I, I think you have an instinct for storytelling and finding distinctive voices to help you tell those stories, or you don't. You can read all the books in the world. You can take all the courses. And if you don't write from your gut or you don't write from instinct, and if you're not a natural storyteller, then it's just going to be hard for you. Yeah, you. I mean, you can. anybody can write a script. You, know? you can put together 120 pages in that format. I had, my son wrote three scripts by the time he was 12, you know, they didn't make much sense, but they were, they were scripts. <laughs> they were 120 pages. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, he was actually very, he was very smart and talented guy. So, and my, my, my other son is now in LA studying acting and writing screenplays. Oh, wow. And I'm talking to him about all the time and I'm always telling him to dig deeper, you know, don't, don't write from your head, write from your gut, you know? Write the movie you want to see that you know will have an impact on your life emotionally, you know, and and don't do it in a calculated way. Don't do it like, hey, you know, if I have him uh, walk out the door at this point, they're going to cry. Yeah. Then you're then you're you're thinking about effect, and you're not thinking about the actual moment. You you don't think about how it's going to play. You think about how uh, it, it's going to affect you, and you know when the, with the the, the because of the two movies that I've done have, have created emotional moments for people that they they I'm I'm associated with that and I have two movies out now that I mean The Hill is another one that um, it, it's a movie that I wrote 13 years ago that just is was on and Netflix number one film in Netflix for the last week really yeah like right now oh yeah it's out there just yeah go go just don't, it, it dennis, took us this long to get into dennis it. Yeah, quaid yeah. dennis quaid well, yeah and then my all-american which is another tear jerker so to speak um and uh is that you know i don't write it from uh, with the intention of making people cry but when i'm writing it authentically and i'm connected to those characters and are i'm in those moments i do cry myself you know, so I know if I cry, there's a shot other people might. Yeah. Looking to embrace a sober lifestyle or cut back on your alcohol intake? No Buzz Bottles is here for you. Featuring alcohol-free beer, wine, and spirits, there's no need to feel left out at your next get-together. Plus, you'll feel a lot better and be a lot more productive the next day. Locally owned and operated, No Buzz Bottles has a wide variety of offerings, including alternatives for rosé, gin, rum, seltzers, and more. Best of all, they have free local delivery on all orders. Check them out today at nobuzzbottles.com. Man, that's is this is so so fascinating to me. It's uh I don't know, yeah, just the to be able to have that skill to be able to to move people without even trying to and like setting out to do that and just creating something out of nothing and just being able to take you know whatever that crazy mind is thinking of and coming up with and laying it out in- you know, well, it, it's actually, uh, and, and I only recognize this in retrospect because I, 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 uh, you know, I've been in and out of therapy, you know, and uh, and we talk about the films I've done, and my therapist said, you know, you're you're working out your life, you know, you, this is therapeutic for you to to go deep, because you know you lived a lot of your life of not going deep, you know, and this is a way of giving voices to voices that haven't been heard, you know, within your own psyche. So, um, hmm. you know, I will say that 
you know, uh, for example, the like Hoosiers, a lot of people think, oh, you know, what a good heart of, you know, br- sunshine and bright. And <laughs> it's a very dark film, okay, about all the, the people uh, who are the principals are really screwed up, neurotic, stuck in their <laughs> life. These are very unhappy people. It is a miserable group of people, okay? Now, the reason it works is because we break the things that they're stuck in, you know, their blind spots. All of a sudden they can see something is possible in the future. And, uh, and, and they're, and they have a chance, you know, and it, it is, it is about second chances, but um, you know, people think about the last shot and how happy they feel, but and and shooter, you know, getting sober and all that stuff. But you know, the reason it works is because we're in the dark most of the time, but we come into the light and we enter the light. But the movie is not sunshine and light. Yeah, all. not at all. And how- by the way, Rudy's a pretty dark film too. Really yeah. is. Well, well, that again, was a, he was he was yeah, he was finding his own demons and depression and you know. All well, and stuff. it's, I mean, like I was mentioning, it's just a, con- it's a, man, it's a constant beat down of mm-hmm. like, what, like you got no chance. And yeah, but that's, that, but that, but that's sort of, that's one of the things why I think uh, both, uh, but that movie is sustained in popular culture as long as it has, because it's relatable because so many people can th- see their own lives, yeah, you know, as li- get, getting beat not, down. Yeah. yeah get, it just does like not that. stop. Yeah. It's just like, and, yeah. and, and it's one of the reasons that, you know, uh, in a way, He's a real hero, and and in the way that, um, in, in a couple of ways. First of all, he never gives away the power to let other people define who he is or what is possible for him. Okay, that's heroic because we're all influenced by friends, family, and society, um, and we're told you're not going to be good at that. Don't waste your time. You should go into that. You know, and we mostly follow a lot of especially if they come from people who are smarter than we are, who are uh, more mature and, and people we respect and admire. And the, the, the second aspect about it is that he's an average guy, you know, and, and most of us think about, you know, he's not, uh, you know, from the, you know, the Marvel, he doesn't have any superpower. Yeah, or anything or he's like not that. six, four, yeah. 240. Yeah, exactly. You know? yeah. Yeah, so that, yeah, that's right. He doesn't have, he's not Travis Kelsey. I'm not going to write yeah. the Travis Kelsey story. Yeah. Right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. and, and, um, but the, um, my goal in this movie, uh, Rudy was to make it not for the, the, the audience that you would think that I had in mind. And I'll, I'll give you an example of the perfect response I got from the, we had a premiere in uh, South Bend. We had a premiere in LA and this woman came up to me afterwards. I don't remember anything else anybody said because it was all blur, <laughs> but I remember this. It was because it really moved me. And, and this was my target audience. She came up to me and she said, my husband works in marketing for TriStar. And he kept on saying, I need to see this movie. And he would describe what the story was. I said, why would I be remotely interested in that movie? A, I don't like football. In fact, I hate all sports. And I grew up in Chicago, and every person who went to Notre Dame was so arrogant. I can't stand Notre Dame. (laughs) So there's nothing in this movie for me. not for me. Yeah, right? And here I finally said yes, and I'm crying for the last 10 minutes of this movie. And, and, And I tried to figure out why, and it's like, that's me. You know, that's me. And that's why I wanted to reach her. That is the target audience. It's not football. It's not Notre Dame. It's not, uh, you know, anybody uh, who uh, cares about sports at all. It's someone who, in her case, she said she always wanted to be, she had a passion to, for being, uh, you know, an artist. And uh, her, you know, family and her friends, you know, beat on her that that's not, you know, how to make a living and all like, and she went to law school and was a successful lawyer, but she's always been miserable and she's always second guessed. And uh, so he said, why wasn't I Rudy? Why did I not just say to hell with it? I have my dream and I don't care what anybody says. Yeah. And, uh, and, and I think a lot of people have that, that feeling about um, watching that film, if not consciously, unconsciously. Yeah. Or just even if you went after you, your dream, just still just 
getting beat down and then it all paying off. Like well, they're finally no, being the, like, yeah, I didn't. Yeah. I, and also uh, at any, every step along the way, yeah, you know, non-stop. in the journey, they could be at the very beginning of the journey. Yeah. You know, I've heard stories from younger people saying Rudy gave me, you know, hope to keep on pushing and keep on pushing no matter how many times I, the door was slammed in my face. So, I, I love how you said she was crying like the last 10 minutes. Cause Rudy, it doesn't have like, just like one moment. It is like, uh, it's a, a long duration at the end of yeah. just like this overall it was weird i really and i'm so glad it worked out that i did just watch it last you know mm. because it's still so fresh where it's like it is this extended period of release almost mm. of just like oh shit like i just i don't even know how to describe it it's not just a one really sad moment or, or it's just extended happiness and you just feel feel joy yeah. for him just continuing to keep going and going and going and All just right. having that, that payoff. But, and what, uh, and, and I will say, uh, uh, you know, th- th- there's, I grew up in Bloomington and, and, and when, when Rudy approached me to do this, I was not interested. I mean, we just, I didn't want to do another Indiana sports film and I never liked Notre Dame. I just always disliked them intensely. In fact. And, um, but I ended up doing it. <clears throat> I mean, I'm not going to go through the whole story of how it, I mean, it's a journey before I finally said yes. But I look back and one of the reasons I, I said yes is getting involved in the film business and trying to make it to try to get a movie made is almost as impossible <laughs> as Rudy trying yeah. to get on the field. <laughs> and I'll never forget one of my first mentors said to me that um three th- i mean i these are different mentors but the one was uh, uh, to try to make it in the film business is like diving into a sea of no's swimming toward an island of yes that you don't even know exists and uh that was one the other one was if you personalize rejection you're done you're finished because you're going to live with no's every day they're going to reject your work they're going to reject you no, 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 no. You got to be a bozo doll. You know the things in the sand at the bottom. They pound. You have to pounce right back up. You cannot <laughs> yeah. let other people's, uh, you know, uh, opinion of you or your work affect you at all. They, you know, and that's hard. And that's really hard. Boy, I mean, because you know when somebody who is a head of a studio or a famous movie star, re- you know, reads your work and says it's shit. You know, it's like, well, they should know. Well, I learned very early on. Uh, with, uh, you know, working with some of these people too, that that some of them are really dumb. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, it's still... But no, but some of them have bad taste. I shouldn't say... Being being smart, smart or dumb is actually, that was the wrong thing to say. Dumb is not not the the right word. Well, just... Uh, sometimes it's just different taste, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, it, it just, you yeah. know, they don't, it's they not, don't see the vision or they don't, they don't get it. Yeah. They don't yeah. get it, but it doesn't mean that somebody else won't get it. I mean, you, you don't, you don't give the power away. So yeah, it's, you don't give the power away. And that's really the most important message of, for Rudy. And that was the got one, a guiding principle for me trying to make it in the film business, man. That's, um, w- Thank you so much for sharing all that. Cause that's, I, I can't tell you enough how much I enjoyed um, that. I've got one last writing question and then we'll move on to food. I promise. I hope you guys are enjoying <laughs> this as much as I am. Um, when you sit down to write, what are you just like going in a room, no music, light keyboard, cup of coffee? Like what, you know what I mean? I'm just like, do you have a standard setting of like, okay, I'm going to write. Um, so uh, it's very hard. I don't, I'm not like Hemingway who wrote nine to 12, you know, every morning. And, uh, I don't have a, a routine or a schedule. I usually write, um, in, um, so of, of the, with the exception of one script, every script that I've done, I've been a writer for hire. Okay. Since Hoosiers. And, uh, as a way to make a living, raise my family, and so on and so forth, rather than write on spec. Um, and uh, what would happen is we'd all be happy. Uh, well, let's we talk about it. I do the research. I do the research. I do the. Re- I keep on putting off sitting down <laughs> until finally uh, it's like uh, okay, you're you're due in two weeks, and I and I'm thinking, oh my god, I've got to start writing this. <laughs> So I start in a panic. I start writing. All right. (laughs) And usually I write at night. I don't, I'm not a morning person at all. So it's like when everybody goes to bed, I start at 10, write till about one or two or whatever. 
And then, um, and then uh, I'm pretty good for the first 25 pages. It gives me a sense. Okay, I'm up. The, I'm climbing up the mountain. I can take a. Br- I can take a rest. And I, sometimes I rest for way too long, like a week or two before <laughs> before I plunge into the horrible second act. And um, by the time I wrestle my way through the second act, um, I'm getting calls, uh, threatening calls from my producers, <laughs> lawyers. You're two months behind. Uh, yeah, you've got to. Uh, and um, and then I kind of the last 30 pages are actually the easiest because all the elements are in place. I know my character's voices and I'm panicked to finish it. <laughs> so I write the, it may take me a week or two to uh, two weeks to write the first 25 pages, two months to write the second 25, 30 or 40 pages and about four or five days to write yeah. the last 20, 25 pages. Huh. So, it yeah. makes, it makes sense. Cause yeah, yeah. once you already, or to the end, yeah, you're just bringing together all the stuff. Yeah, like you said, you've already figured out who's who and what you're trying to accomplish. Well, you're just and, tying and, it all and, up. and the thing about music is I generally don't like to play music at the beginning. I don't want clutter. I don't want outside influences. But I'm always playing music in the last act. Interesting. Because I know what I'm going for, and I know the feeling I'm going for. So I utilize soundtracks uh, of, of movies that uh, I, I really, not the movies I like, I really like certain soundtracks. Some of these soundtracks are not the great movies, but I'm a huge James Horner fan. And, uh, you know, he, I mean, I could name so many of his, but he, you know, Field of Dreams and Braveheart and uh, Legends of the Fall, and I mean, uh, it goes on and on. And so I... I find his uh, his writing so emotional and stirring, and um, the New World is another one. So, so you're listening to that soundtrack while you're writing? I am. I yeah. do. Yeah. Huh. So I I just love like because that's something I feel like I don't normally think about is like yeah what's the setting what are you doing you know are yeah. you having a you know you think of an old a writer with a cup of coffee and a cigarette and it's usually yeah in the morning but I feel like at night makes sense because it's yeah. peaceful no one's calling you you're that's not it. getting distracted yeah that's exactly right I'm not distracted that's the big thing so you did such a good job of bringing us into the episode that I had this really bad intro I wanted to do um, but you were just kicked it off so I didn't do it. Because I was going to be like, we've got, I know what you're thinking. We normally do food. We figured pizza, pizza, what's the difference? We got Angela pizza. <laughs> Sorry. Uh. Uh, so we got to talk about food. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Are you going to ask me my favorite pizza in Bloomington? No, no, no I'm I'm just, I just good, wanted good, to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm, um, gl- I'm glad you got past that. Thank you. I just need to get it out of my system. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. Good. No, that's, good. uh, you had all this great, um, just <laughs> pros and then I had to just, uh, put a little ribbon on it with what I normally do, which is okay. silly nonsense. <laughs> um, but yeah, I do want to talk a little bit more about other places in town. We got to mm-hmm. cover some of them. Yeah. Um, you know, we were talking a little bit before we went on about good Italian, uh, getting excited to try out Cape Bello with the new owners from 21 right. North. What are some of the, the old favorites and some of the new places that you're looking forward to? So, uh, you know, in terms of the uh, ethnic food, I, I really like Blooming Thai, you know, that just want you know, I, I think they're coming back somewhere. Yeah, they're going to go into the Anatolia building. Yeah, that's good. And they've got I, their food I, truck. I really, I, uh, yeah, I, I, I've not, that's right, they have. I haven't eaten there, but I, I really like them a lot. Yeah. Um, uh, Peanut and Joy, by the way. That's uh, so Joy's the owner. Okay. Um, and then Peanut's one of the main guys cooking, and oh. I think it's her husband as well. Okay. But they set up uh, a food truck Friday, and okay. I've gotten to know them through them having the food truck. Yeah. And they're great people with amazing food. Okay. Yeah, I love their food. Okay. Yeah. Better business, better community. For over a century, the Greater Bloomington Chamber of Commerce has been a cornerstone of business growth and community development. They are dedicated to helping local businesses thrive. Their business is all about your business. Join the Chamber today. Call 812-336-6381 or visit chamberbloomington.org to learn more. I happen to like Marco Polo, that new restaurant. Yeah, the Uyghur restaurant. Yes, yeah, that's right. Um, In terms of uh, just tradition, uh, I'm just, uh, you know... I love rags and I, you know, I go to, I still go to Nick's uh, oh, yeah. once a month, just, uh, at part of the tradition. You want to just like sit at the downstairs bar, have lunch type, type of deal. I don't, I don't sit at the bar. I mean, I usually go there with a person, oh, okay. somebody, yeah, yeah. you know, yeah. And then 
Look, you know, Strats and Michael, you know, an uptown cafe. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I was there at the beginning and, uh, you know, they're good friends of mine. And uh, so I'm loyal to them, you know, and, and they, you know, he, they do a good job there. They really do. I, I, uh, I, I like Michael a lot and I, I do everything I can to support that place just in terms of bringing people there. And it's a good place to bring people from out of town, mm -hmm. uh, you know, because there's something there for everybody. You know, it's kind of a people pleaser yeah. kind of menu. Yeah. It works, and, works in that re regard. Insanely consistent. Yeah. You know, and it's, exactly. it's a great atmosphere, great yes. ambiance. The service is always yeah. Yeah. prompt. Yeah. Yeah, I uh, refuse to go to Malibu anymore. Oh wow! Yeah. I, can, I want to hear the story. No. Well, uh, yeah, um, um, you know, um, Chick was uh, was a close friend, and yeah, yeah, he got fired unfairly, and um, I'm not going to support a restaurant then on fire. You know, fired my friend um, uh, quite unfairly. Yeah. So. Um, you know, I Rick, I knew, I know the owner. I've known him for years, Rick Coombs, and uh, mm -hmm. you know. I know his brother kind of runs the place now. I just, yeah. I, I'm, I'm done. Yeah, I place. should have known yeah. that that was it. Um, because yeah. I love Chick, I love Emmy. Yeah, they're yeah. both amazing. There you go. I'm right. hoping my family has a place in Culver, and yeah. Chick has a, I think has a place. His family's yeah. had a place in Culver for a yeah. long time. Right. So I've been trying to link up up there at some point, uh -huh. but sure. they're just two of, yeah, Chick and Emmy are two of the sweetest, kindest people. Yeah. You know? So that's, um, yeah, I should have known that was the answer. Yeah. <laughs> And as far as Mexican, I don't think anything has really rocked my boat. I don't think there's anything that uh, I, I would say, oh, you have to go here or there. You know, it's, to me, it's a kind of all a little bit like, you know, Uno Mas and Ranchero is kind of like uh, or, or uh, Riviera Maya. It's all yeah. f sort of feels like chain like in a mm -hmm. weird sort of way. Generic. I guess that's the word. Generic. Yeah. Nothing that, well, you know, wow, there's a real chef's mind behind here. You know, yeah. That's doing something special. Uh, yeah. Maybe. I can, I can see that. You know, I enjoy it for what it is. Um, it is what it, it is. is. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. It yeah. is a very, it comes out in three minutes. Yeah. Uh, it's, yeah. They've and got it. They've the got it. Kids like it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's kid friendly for yeah, sure. They got yeah. a system down. Yeah, they do. Yeah. Um, all right. Last thing. I know you're a big IU basketball fan. You able to talk about current thoughts at all? I don't know how candid you're allowed to be. <laughs> I know you're a big supporter <laughs> of the program, so I don't want to put you too much hey, on the spot. Hey, it's one of the reasons I moved back. One of the reasons I love being back here is going to all the home games because yeah. I, I didn't get to do that, in, uh, obviously, in, in uh, California. <clears throat> um, I'm, just, I'm just hoping, you know. Um, uh, it, it's uh, right now we are struggling to find that light at the end of the tunnel right now, because obviously the season hasn't turned out like we all hoped uh, or expected. And um, I am, uh, I, I don't like to point the finger and, and play the blame game. I, I know Woody is just getting killed. I know that his, I, I, whether his seat is hot or not, we know he's going to get another year. Yeah. I mean, that's just in the cards. And uh, we have seven more games. Uh, you know, I think how we finish is are going to determine a lot of the fans' attitude toward next year. And and I think it will affect recruiting uh, both in the portal and in high school. So if we kind of rise to the occasion, even break even, win the games we're supposed to and maybe pick up an upset, you know, I think that the pitchforks might be uh, laid down a little bit. And then if we have success in the portal – and, you know, pick up a high school player that maybe we weren't expecting, then I think temperatures will cool down. However, if we, like, lose out, it's going to be ugly. Yeah. It's going to be really ugly. And I'm. it wouldn't shock me if Woody just walked away because it's no, – it, there's worse, nothing – it, it, it's, it's, it's fever pitch now, people yeah. upset, upset. And it's not, it's not like – it's not about winning and losing so much. It's it's the losses are humiliating. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, it's it's, not, it's, yeah. it's getting completely crushed by UConn and Auburn and of course Purdue. Yep. I mean, this these two games were the largest margin uh, in, since 1934. You know, and and I think it's again, if we were competitive at least most of the way, uh, and then lost it at the end or something like that, I think would people understand the flaws that we have and say, okay, but sometimes it's like, we're not even, we shouldn't even be on the same court with some of these teams. Yeah. And, and also, you know, listen, basketball fans in, in Indiana and Bloomington are savvy. They know the game. They know the game. I mean, I love going to the women's game. 
you know, that, that team, as opposed to the men's team, both offense and defense are so connected. And that's such a beautifully co- uh, coached team. And, uh, and there are times where we look so disconnected. That is our men's team on, on the floor. And of course, you know, Woody's going to get the blame for that. And, and fairly, it's, it, it, it's fairly, it is fair to get the blame. Uh, and, 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 and we follow the Big Ten. And you see a, a team like, uh, and I think what's upsetting is we have three five-star players on our team, okay? When Penn State uh, has a new coach, Mike Rhodes, and they started off, they had 10 portal players, three freshmen, nobody had ever played together. It was, uh, at the beginning of the season, they were terrible. It was yeah. a shit show. And you know what? They're a better team than we are now. It wasn't a fluke that they beat us. They've become a really good team. That's a very well-coached team. And we recognize and see well-coached teams that come in and uh, and handle us. And that's why I think so many people are upset. But, you know, listen, I, I'm, I'm holding out that, that Woody has learned and he keeps on learning and that we get um, the right combination of players. I, I believe that each one of our starting five has a flaw. And, and, and those flaws really exacerbate the problems within the team. Uh, and, and, and losing, losing X was hard. We, you know, it's a guards game, you know, the college game is a guard game and we, and we, we struggle, you know, I mean, Gabe Cubs is a great kid, you know, fundamentally sound, but he, he's not, a, he's not ready to be a big yeah. 10 great player. motor, but yeah. It yeah. Doesn't, yeah. And, and Trey, uh, you know, is so incredibly erratic and, you know, if he's not hitting that three point shot, then we, we have no three point shooting and you can't win today without three point. No shooting. chance. So yeah. I'm saying all the obvious things, but yeah, no, no, uh, no. That's <laughs> I, your passion shines through, you know, I, you, I care. I know. I care. Yeah, yeah. And I get, a, I get so upset, you know, I mean, it's like, it's like a gut punch, you know, when I, and and I happen to uh, I, I I happen to get too emotional sometimes, and it's I'm like watching this last game against Purdue. I I tell everybody I don't want to watch any games with anybody. Don't come to my house. I I tell my girlfriend stay far away from me. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, don't look at me this way. Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> and uh, and uh, so this game, it's like I have I have so much admiration for Matt Painter. I think that this guy. Um, has done a phenomenal job. He's built a great culture. And boy, if I was a high school player, if I had a kid, I would be happy if you went there. I really do. Yeah. As, as what he's done. He, it's, it's, you know, Can't been very it. impressive. And, and I met him when he was like uh, living with Pat Knight uh, one summer, you know, he wanted to go to IU really yeah, badly. Really? You know? Oh yeah. And, uh, uh, Knight didn't think he was good enough though. So, uh, um, he's always, I think had a thing, uh, like got to you, but, but I was so really pissed off at him. He had his starters in there with a 23 point lead with 40 seconds to go. It was like, Matt, you son of a bitch. You know? But looking back, I was saying, you know, uh, he, you know, a lot of it's Ken Palm and, you know, you don't want to get, you know, throw your scrubs in and then all of a sudden it's, t- it's a 10 point game. Yeah. So, and then you're uh, getting a two seed instead of a one seed. Then, yeah. All because I, of yeah, some it, yeah. Yeah. It's, I get it. I get yeah. It. yeah um, so. Last thing, any yeah. thoughts? Have you met Coach Sig? Any thoughts on football? I haven't, but I'm really pumped up. Um, I'm, yeah. I, he's the kind of coach that, um, you know, he he feels cut from the cloth of, of Nick Saban. You know, it, he's not definitely a people pleaser. He's no, not someone who uh, t- he doesn't though. suffer fools. You know, yeah. I mean, uh, you better be on your toes if you're in your interview with him. If you got him in there. Yeah. Don't ask a dumb question, yeah. or he'll lay you no, out. No pizza, yeah, pizza right. jokes. So, yeah. so my, yeah, no, 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 no pizza <laughs> jokes. Yeah. So uh, this is uh, this is my favorite. The first press conference. He. he uh, somebody asked a question about the NIL. So he kind of goes through his, you know, his experience and what he did. And he kind of like told this guy, he said, well, you didn't think we had an NIL like James Madison, you know, it's almost like subtextually do your research. Right. Uh-huh. So it was like the guy asked a question, like, is this is your first time with NIL? Are you, he didn't say it quite that way. He implied it. Uh-huh. And then Jim Coyle about five questions later asked the same question, but worded it differently. And and Coach Sig leans over and said, "What was it about the first way I answered this question you didn't understand?" Okay, 
<laughs> I, I uh, loved it because yeah. if that was Tom Allen, and I love Tom Allen, yeah, just yeah, a great, great guy. He would have answered, he it, answered it like it was the first time he yeah. ever heard the question, yeah. right? Well, and it's again, yeah, Tom was such a nice guy, but it's it's after after that you almost wanted somebody like this to come in that is so kind of no nonsense and mm. what well, it was just like, yeah, Google me, you know. Yeah. <laughs> It was like, uh, yeah, that was a great answer too. Uh-huh. Yeah. What do you, what, how do you pitch, you know, new recruits or portal uh-huh. players? Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Google Go- me. I win. Google <laughs> me. Yeah. That should be a t-shirt. I win. Google oh, yeah. me. Yeah. That'll, that'll be so, our first no dishes yeah. merch. We'll just- <laughs> so, yeah. so uh, uh, I, I, uh, I, I don't know if this is an apocryphal story or not, but I, I heard from a secondary source that uh, he came, he came across um, uh, one of these, uh, posters or bracelets or whatever, LEO. Uh-huh, yeah. And he, and and he said to to guy who was helping to move in. He said, "Who's this Leo guy?" Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and and uh, dude, that's and, so and good. Like, I love and, that and, so and, much. And then when he was told, he said, "I don't want to ever see this stuff." Uh-huh, right yeah. Oh, right yeah. So- <laughs> <laughs> who's this? Le- oh man! If I ever get a chance, I'm leaving out with that. Hey, who's this Leo guy? <laughs> Oh my God. I love that so much. Um, Angelo, you're a legend, man. Thank you so much for taking the time. Sure. It's really been a pleasure. Um, Enjoyed it. Thank you. Looking forward to checking out Cabela with you. So where the hell is my ice cream? Yeah. Yeah. You're like, what the hell dude? I was promised some salty. Yeah. Some moose dream. We're right across the street. Let's go. I'm I'm kidding. I'm kidding. (laughs) But you, you get that at the end of every interview. Not that or anytime I go somewhere, Uh, they're like, where's my uh, ice cream? Oh yeah. And I was like, I'm I'm still trying to develop the freezer cargo pants yeah. you know so i can carry yeah. it around right with me exactly around. yeah what another great episode thanks again to visit bloomington for being our season five title sponsor if you haven't checked them out yet go to visit bloomington.com this episode of the no dishes podcast was recorded edited and produced by garrett portinga of green hot no media dishes. in beautiful downtown no bloomington dishes. indiana no dishes No dishes media. No dishes media.